Hello students, in this session we will discuss column and struct. So we start with introduction of column and struct and then we will discuss important terminologies, radius of gyration and slenderness ratio. After that we will discuss difference between long column and short column and then we will discuss crushing load and crippling load. After that we will discuss formulas to calculate crushing load and crippling load and then we will discuss effective length of the column under various column and conditions. So let's start with introduction of column and strut. So we will start with strut. What is strut? So the strut is a structural member subjected to axial compressive load. Okay, and struts are generally used as roof truss and breech trusses. So here in the picture you can see that this is the breech truss and the inclined member of this breech is called strut. Strut may be vertical, horizontal or inclined and the cross section dimension of the strut are comparatively small. Normally struts carry smaller compressive load Okay, now let's discuss what is column. So, when strut is vertical, it is called column. Normally, columns are designed to carry heavy compressive loads. And columns are, as we all know, they are used in concrete and steel buildings. And here in the picture, you can see that this is the example of circular concrete column. Okay, now... Let's move to our next topic and here we will discuss important terminology that is radius of gyration. Radius of gyration is denoted by small k and here is the definition of radius of gyration. So let's first read definition. The distance from the given axis at which if all the small elements of the lamina are placed, the Moment of inertia of lamina about the given axis does not change. This distance is called radius of gyration. So, let's understand this definition by means of this figure. Okay, so here first of all we will discuss figure A. Here in figure A there is one irregular shape lamina with total area is equal to capital A. Now, Let's consider that the lamina is divided into small elements each of equal shape and size and area of each small element is dA. Okay. Now let's take moment of inertia of each small element of this lamina from the reference axis A. Then it will be IAB moment of inertia is equal to suppose we are taking moment of first small element from the reference axis A. Then we know that moment of inertia is nothing but the second moment of area. So for first small element moment of inertia about reference axis AB is equal to area of the first small element which is DA into distance square. Distance is what? Distance of small element from the reference axis. Here in our case, first small element is at a distance of R1 from the reference axis AB. So it will be R1 square. So we can say that moment of inertia of first small element from reference axis AB is equal to dA into R square. Similarly, moment of inertia of second small element from reference axis AB is equal to dA into R square. Similarly, for third small element, it will be dA into R3 square. I will repeat it till n numbers because we assume that the lamina is divided into n numbers of small element. And if I add all the moment of inertia of each small element, then I will get IAB is equal to sigma dA into R square, where sigma dA is summation of area of each small element, which is equal to total area of this whole lamina. 
So I can say that I is equal to A R square. Now let's read this definition again. Here the distance from the given axis at which if all the small element of the lamina are placed. Okay. So as per this definition in figure B what I did is I place or arrange all the small elements at a distance k from reference axis A. Such that the moment of inertia of the lamina about given axis does not change. Okay. So as per the definition I just simply arrange all small element at a distance k so that moment of inertia of whole lamina about reference axis AB does not change. Okay. So now let's take moment of inertia of each small element from reference axis. Then it will be suppose for the first small element it will be dA into k square because here distance of small element from reference axis is k. Similarly for second uh, small element it will be dA into k square. Similarly for third it is dA into k square. I will repeat it for the n numbers. Okay, so I am getting total IAB is equal to sigma dA into k square. Here sigma dA is equal to A. So I can say that I is equal to A k square. So I can write down k is equal to under root I upon A. Here is the equation to calculate radius of gyration and the equation is very most important for calculating numericals. Okay. Now let's discuss slenderness ratio. Slenderness ratio is denoted by lambda and slenderness ratio is equal to effective length of the column upon minimum radius of gyration. Okay. Now what is effective length of the column? We know that column are designed to carry axial compressive load and whenever the load column is subjected to compressive load bending will occur in a column section. So that band portion of the uh, column or band length of the column is called effective length of the column which is denoted by Le. And minimum radius of gyration is k minimum. So we can say that slenderness ratio lambda is equal to effective length of column which is Le upon k minimum which is minimum radius of gyration. Okay. Slenderness ratio is very useful to uh, know that the column is either short column or long column. So let's discuss first what is long column and then we will discuss what is short column so we can clearly differentiate both. Okay. So the long column when the length of column is more as compared to its cross sectional dimension it is called long column. Mathematically we can say that if ratio of effective length of the column upon diameter of the column is greater or equal to 12 we can say that the column is long column or if lambda which is slenderness ratio is greater than or equal to 50 then also we can say that the column is long column. Now let's discuss what is short column. So when length of the column is less as compared to its cross sectional dimension it is called short column. Mathematically we can say that effective length of the column and diameter of the column when we are taking the ratio of effective length of the column and diameter of the column and if it is less than 12 then we can say that the column is short column. Or if slenderness ratio lambda is less than 50 then also we can say that the column is short column. Now let's move to next topic and here we will discuss what is crushing load. So in case of short columns with increase in axial compressive load compressive stresses increases. After some load the column fails by crushing. The load at which short column fails by crushing is called crushing load. Okay. So we all know that the columns are designed to carry axial compressive load. 
and with the increase in axial compressive load there will be increase in compressive stresses in a column section so here in this picture you can see that this is the short column which is subjected to axial compressive load so with the increase in the load uh, there will be increase in compressive stresses also and at certain point of the load the column will crush here you can see that the column is crushed or in other word we can say that the column fails okay so that particular load is called crushing load for the short column okay now let's discuss what is crippling load so in case of long columns with increase in axial compressive load compressive stresses increases after some load the column starts buckling or bending and bending stresses also produces finally column phase by buckling the load at which column phase by buckling is called crippling load so here in this picture you can see that this is a long column which is subjected to axial compressive load and as the load increases uh, compressive stresses also increase and because it is long column first of all it will bend or buckle okay and because of bending bending stresses will be generated and that's why at certain point of the load the column will fail that particular load is known as crippling load okay so in the next slide we will discuss formulas which we will use to calculate crushing and crippling load okay so let's first discuss euler's formula the formula is invented by the scientist named euler that's why this formula is called euler's formula euler's formula is used to calculate crippling load and it is specially applicable for the long columns only so here is the euler's formula pe is equal to pi square e i upon l e square okay where pe is nothing but euler's crippling load e is modulus of elasticity i is moment of inertia and l e is effective length of the column now the second formula is the rankine's formula the formula is invented by scientist named rankine that's why the formula is called rankine's formula the formula is used to calculate crippling or crushing load okay and the formula is applicable for both long and short column so here is the formula pr is equal to fc into a upon 1 plus alpha le by k square here we know that le by k is nothing but slendernes ratio lambda so i am replacing le by k with lambda so i am getting pr is equal to fc into a upon 1 plus alpha into lambda square okay so here we just discuss formulas in next few sessions we will discuss the formula in more detail way and we will also solve few numericals okay so let's move to our next topic and here we will discuss effective length of the column under different column and condition so let's start with case number 1 here we are considering that both the end of the column is hinged so you can see that and a and and b of this given column has hinged end okay and this column is subjected to compressive axial load p and because of the load the column will bend throughout its length okay both the end of the column has hinge support and if we apply axial load then it will bend throughout its length and effective length is what effective length is the bending length of the column so here whole length of the column get bent that's why we can say that effective length of the column in case when both the end of the column are hinged it is equal to its original length so in first case when both the end of the column are hinged l e is equal to l now let's move to our second case here both the end 
of the column are fixed. You can see that and A and and B both are fixed. Okay. Here the column is subjected to axial load P. And because of the axial load, you can see that the middle length of the column get deflected. Okay. So, in this case, we can say that effective length of this column is equal to original length by 2. So, whenever both the end of the column are fixed, then effective length LE is equal to original length by 2, which is L by 2. Okay. Now, let's discuss case number 3. In case number 3, one end is fixed and other end is hinged. So, you can see that end B of this column is fixed and end A is hinged. Okay. And if the column is subjected to axial compressive load, then the column will bend in upper portion. Okay. Because as end B is fixed. Okay. So, the column will bend in upper portion. Okay, an effective length of such column will be equal to original length upon under root 2. Okay, so we need to remember this equation. Okay, when one end of the column is fixed and other is hinged, then LE is equal to L upon under root 2. Okay, now let's discuss our last case here. Uh, one end of the column is fixed and other end is free. So, you can see that in this given figure, end B is fixed and end A is free. So, if such kind of the column is subjected to axial load P, then the column will bend like this and its effective length will be equal to twice its original length. So, we can say that LE for the column with one end fixed and other end free is equal to 2L. Okay. So, this is end of this session. In next session, we will discuss Euler's formula and we will uh, solve few numericals also. Thank you.